section today, but we are in our, our second week of a sermon series I've started here looking at Elisha, uh, coming out of the Old Testament, of course, way, way back into Second Kings. And if you don't know where Second Kings is in your Bible, it's about a quarter of the way into your Bible. So it's fairly early on in your Bible. We're going to be in Second Kings today uh, almost exclusively. I'll reference some other stuff, but if you want to follow along today, Second Kings 3, 9 through 12 will be our focus verses. If by chance you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles on the Welcome Center. They're light blue. You're welcome to take one of those home with you. If you know somebody who doesn't have a Bible, take it and give it to them. I've got more in my office. I will replenish it. So we love giving Bibles away. We want to make sure everybody has the Word of God. If you don't have that, but you've got an iPhone, iPad, Android, whatever you got, U version, Y-O-U version is a great uh, Bible app. I would recommend that one to you as well. But there are some in the pews if you need. We're going to be, like I said, in Second Kings 3, 9 through 12 for most of the time. If you weren't here last week when we kicked this off, we talked about killing cows and burning plows. And you're going to have to get online and watch that one to see what that means. But what it overall means is uh, leaving behind anything that would keep us from following God and moving ahead. To give you a little context for our study today, we're going to see in the story today that there were three kings. These three kings come together and join forces to go and do battle against the evil Moabites. Everybody hates the Moabites, right? You're supposed to hiss there or something. But these three kings come together, and they're going to join together, join their forces, and they're going to go stomp the Moabites to oblivion, is their thought. They, they think, yeah, this will be easy. If we join forces, no problem. We'll have a very decisive victory. But as is often the case in life, things don't go as planned. Anybody ever experienced that? You think, oh yeah, we got this covered, and then something happens. And all of a sudden, you're scrambling to figure out, now what do I do? So they thought they had it figured out. And then all of a sudden, whoops, uh, things didn't turn out the way they were thinking. And instead of winning easily, they find their troops marching for seven days, wandering in the desert. And they come to the realization, we are completely out of water. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in the desert. I've been in the desert in a couple of different places. And running out of water is not pleasant. Um, I've been severely dehydrated at different points in my life, and it's misery. And that is where they find themselves. They, they are about to die of thirst. Their animals are about to die of thirst. They have significant need. And the story is going to teach us this principle. If you're taking notes, this will be your first one. It'll be good news, I think, to many of us. And your first note there is, your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend upon God. This will be good news, hopefully, to many of you. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend upon God. Let's read our text and let it uh, bring to light this powerful truth. As I said, Second Kings three nineteen through 21... Uh, Let's jump in right there in verse 9. 9, I screwed those numbers up. 9 through 12, not 19 through 21. 9 through 12. 2 Kings 3, 9 through 12. There it says, The king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. So there's our three kings. And it says, After a roundabout march of about seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for their animals that were with them. So they're in trouble. Verse 10. What, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of the Moabites? Basically, he's blaming God. He's saying, did God call us together just to give us over to our enemies? We thought we'd win easily, right? Now it looks like we're going to get destroyed. But Jehoshaphat, one of the kings, asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel said, Elisha, hey, hey, Elisha, yeah, Elisha, son of Shaphat is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, if you don't know the backstory, let me remind you, Elijah was this famous Old Testament prophet. Everybody knew who Elijah was. He was a big deal. And Elijah mentored Elisha. And so, 
uh, uh, part of the back story of Elijah was, once upon a time in the story of Elijah, there was a tremendous drought in all of the land. And Elijah calls upon God. And off in the distance, they see a tiny little cloud the size of my fist. Tiny little cloud. And from that cloud comes one of the biggest, greatest, grandest storms. It waters everything. It breaks the drought. And so they are thinking, if this is the servant, the guy who came underneath Elijah, maybe he can call upon God and bring us some water too. Verse 12, Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with Elijah. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Eden, Edom went down to him. So let me be abundantly clear here. The three kings are going to go to battle against the Moabites. And they think they're going to win easily. And they think they're going to win quickly. But when they don't, they find big danger and trouble. They're out of water. Now what you may not know is that these three kings, as part of the backstory, were not serving God. If you know the history of Israel, they have little... It's like a roller coaster ride where, where they follow God for a while, right? And then they hit the top, boom, and they come crashing back down again, and they follow other gods. And it's uh, all through the Old Testament. It's up and down and up and down, and, and sadly, it's a lot more down than it is up. But that is the story of sin. And in the story here, these three kings, even though... One of them is the king of Israel, one of them the king of Judah. They are not seeking after and following after God, which is a problem. They, they have not led their people well. Now, all of a sudden, when they're in trouble, maybe this sounds familiar to you, they do what a lot of us do. I'm in trouble. I really haven't been close to God for a while, but God save me. Right? It's like that, that old buddy you call when you get thrown in jail. You come bail me out. I know we haven't talked for like three years, but, you know, hoping you could do me a favor. Right? That's kind of what they're doing to God. Oh, yeah, God, could you help us? We really haven't been, you know, doing anything you wanted us to do. But maybe, he, maybe God would help us. But, you know, I haven't been close to God lately, you know, the kings are thinking. So maybe we can find somebody else to talk to God for us. Right? It's funny, I see that as a pastor sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll, and, and, and this is not a bad thing. I'm not trying to discourage anybody of this. In fact, I would encourage you in this. But I, I get messages from people I haven't talked to since high school sometimes saying something has happened in their life. They don't go to church. They don't have a close pastor. They're near, so they know me and they know I'm a pastor. And so, could you pray for this? Well, absolutely. I would love to pray for them for this. But my hope is they'll eventually connect with a, a local church and a nearby pastor that can be part of their lives rather than me doing it from a distance. But that's kind of where these kings find themselves. And so they're saying, is there anybody who can talk to God for us? Maybe, may, maybe somebody who could come and, 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 and somebody who's really good with God, right? Somebody who's, who's tight with God. Maybe they could come and maybe they do a rain dance for us or something, right? Maybe, maybe they could pull some spiritual strings, Anybody? Do we got anybody? I mean, we got an army out here. Somebody? And finally one of the guys goes, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Elisha. We, we, we have a prophet with us. Maybe. Maybe he can help out. They had likely heard of some of the miracles Elisha was doing in his rookie year as being a prophet. Elisha, as I mentioned last week, second only to Jesus in the number of miracles he performs that are recorded in Scripture. He'd done some pretty amazing things already, like he had separated the River Jordan. Very impressive, right? Another time, he went to this polluted spring, like one of our wells here, you know, and, and it had been, something had gotten in it, and it was poisonous, and you couldn't drink it. If you drank it, you would die. He walks up to this well, he walks up to this spring, and he talks to it. And it's healed. It's clean. It's free of whatever was in it, and you can drink of it. It's safe. And so they're saying, you know, Elijah, he's done some stuff with water. Well, you know, maybe we're in, right? Elijah, can you help us out? So what do you think Elijah's going to do? Any guesses? Maybe you know the story. Let me tell you what he's going to do. He cops an attitude with him. That's what he's going to do. 
Verse 13, if you're following along. Elisha said to the king of Israel, why do you want to involve me? I mean, basically he's saying, okay, you guys have been ignoring God all this time and now, now you're finally getting to me? Why do you want to involve me? Why don't you, why don't you go to the prophets, your mothers and your fathers? He's chiding them. Can you hear his attitude? He's basically saying, you guys should know better. You've been chasing after other gods now for generations. And now that you're in trouble, you're going to come crawling back to me and the God you should be following? Then he goes on. You think he might stop there, but no. He says, why don't you guys, why don't you call on the prophets of your mother? Well, the king of Israel says, no, no, we're not going to do that. Because it was the Lord who called us, three kings together. That's who we're going to call on, is what it says there. So Elisha says, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve. In other words, basically, you guys aren't serving him, but I do. As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve. If I didn't have the respect I have for Jehoshaphat, who happens to be here, He's one of the kings. If I didn't respect him, I'd completely ignore you. I wouldn't pay any attention to you. So he's saying to two out of the three kings, I dislike you so much, I would not help you. But because the third guy's here, I'll make an exception. Right? So he, he really lets them have it. This is, this is the Old Testament prophet way of, of putting them on blast, right? This is saying bad things about him on Twitter. That's what he's doing back in the day. Tapping into a rock or whatever they did. So that's what's going on here. If it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even have time to pay attention to you. That's how low I think of you. But because Jehoshaphat's here, I've decided I'll help you out. So then it gets interesting. If you're following along, he says, if you need a prophet, I'm your man. But, in verse 15, he makes a demand. What is that demand? He says, I need a musician, right? If you want me to give a prophecy, I need some mood music. I need to get my jam on, right? Give me some tunes. They didn't have boom boxes. They didn't have Bluetooth speakers. I need a musician. Go find somebody with a harp, with a lyre, get some drums and maybe some tambourines up in here. We're going to listen to some music. Which sounds kind of funny and y'all just laughed, right? But he wants some good music before he prophecies. Now, it does sound strange, as I said, but the reality was it's not actually that uncommon of a practice for a prophet back in those days. There's something about when you want to worship God, right? It's one of the things we do here. It's one of the reasons we start by singing. Because we want to come in to church and create an environment, and create a mood, and create an attitude in ourselves, a a place of worship. We want to come and make a joyful noise and get our hearts right before we hear the Word of God. So when we get started on a Sunday morning, we, we sing. Because it begins to frame our minds and get our hearts ready. It gets us ready to commune and connect with our Creator God. If you're a follower of Christ, you understand this, right? You, you, you get here, and it might not be your favorite song that week, but it still helps frame your heart. It still gets you in the right mindset. When your heart begins to drift then towards adoration and praise, then you're ready to hear from God. And so that's exactly what Elisha does. He says, rock the harp. And the three kings oblige him. But they're thinking, all right, now he's going to give me some word of encouragement, right? He's going to do something. He, he, he's going to tell us that shazam kapow. God is going to fix our water problem, right? He's going to strike the stone like Moses with a stick and water will pour out. Or, or he'll be like Elijah and he'll pray and that little cloud will turn into a big old storm and we'll get some rain or something like that. That's, I mean, that's what their expectation is. That's precedent. But does he do this for them? No, he doesn't. Instead, Elisha gives them what would absolutely appear to be a ridiculous command. Verses 15 and 16. It says, Then it happened, 
When the music played, the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus says the Lord. Maybe you want to read this aloud with me. What does he say? He says, Make this valley full of ditches. So remember, they've been marching in the desert. Seven days, they're out of water, right? The kings are like, hold on a second. Wait, 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 what? What? You want us to do what? I mean, I thought God was going to make it rain here. I thought we were going to take our shoes off and squish our toes in mud or something, right? You're telling me my troops and animals are about to die... And you want me to tell them to go and do manual labor in the sun in the desert? Have you lost your mind? What are you thinking? Elijah's, yeah, I want him to dig some ditches. But Elijah, there's not even a cloud in the sky. There's there's no sign of ditches. There's no sign of rain. What, What are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. Guys. I want you to go dig some ditches. I want you to go dig ditches. And we're going to see that your greatest need becomes a blessing when it forces you to depend upon God. Verse 17. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. And you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. And then in verse 18, he gets, I mean, it it sounds kind of cocky. And he says, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Right? So you got these guys, they're standing in the sun, or maybe they're in a tent, I don't know. But they're baking in the desert, in the Middle East. No water. And and Elisha's kind of mocking them. Making fun of them a little bit, even. And he's basically like, you have no idea how easy it is for God to fix this problem, right? You have no idea how strong, how mighty, how powerful God is. Remember, they were not worshiping this God. And he's saying basically, you guys are fools. You've been chasing the wrong God. This God is the winner God. Bet on the winner. This is an easy thing to do in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, and by the way, that thing that you wanted, that other thing, he's going to do that as well, right? He's going to deliver Moab into your hands. But first, I want you to go dig some ditches. So what does that mean for us today, right? Well, we're talking about faith that works. We're talking about faith that is effective. In other words, Faith that moves the heart of God and invokes a response from God. I'm talking about faith that truly works. And at the same time, I'm not just talking about faith that is effective, but I'm also talking about faith that is active. Faith that works. Faith that does something. Faith that so believes that God is going to act that we preemptively take a step towards God, believing that God is going to take a step towards us. Here's your big idea for the day. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. Here's what James says, James 2, 26. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also is faith dead without good works. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants to see your faith. He wants to see you digging a ditch. Do you really think that the God who created all of the universe needed a bunch of army guys out in the desert digging ditches to do his work? No, he didn't need them for that. I mean, if he created the sun and the stars and the moon and the sky... You don't think he could just drag his finger along the desert and create some valleys and trenches, right? The point is, he didn't need them for that. But instead, it's almost as if he's saying, you show me your faith, and I'll show you my faithfulness. We see this repeated in Scripture. God loves to see our faith. All over in the New Testament, you see it again and again and again. You see faith in action. Think about Peter. We love Peter. Love to talk about Peter. We relate to Peter very well. Peter was on this boat, right? And he says to Jesus, If you tell me to come, Jesus, I will come. 
If you tell me to get out of this boat, Jesus, I'll get out of this boat. And what did Peter do? When Jesus says, come, he hops over the side of the boat and starts walking on the water. He had faith. Only one guy got out of the boat. The rest of them, they were still sitting in the boat. When you get out of the boat, that's when you see the faith. Eleven other guys? No. I believe that there are many times when God wants to see us participate in the miracle he's about to perform. It's still his miracle, but he wants us to partner with him. Elsewhere in the New Testament, there's a guy with a a withered hand, right? What does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, hey, buddy, stretch out your hand. In other words, I can heal you. I mean, Jesus could walk over. There you go. You're healed, right? When, when there's a woman with uh, a bleeding issue, she just touches his cloak, doesn't even touch him, and she's healed. So if Jesus wants to just, ding, hand fixed, right? No. He says, buddy, open up your hand, right? Just do this. I mean, he could have said, Jesus power, and fixed him. But no. He says, step out in faith, pal. Open your hand. I'm going to heal you, but I want to see your faith. Stretch out your hand. Another time in the Bible, there's a guy who couldn't walk his entire life. Jesus looks at him. He knows what's wrong. He says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Right? You know that story? He says, I'm going to heal you, but I'm not going to pick you up. I want to see that you have the faith to believe what I have said is true. Get up. What does a guy do? Of course he gets up. He's healed. Only God can send the water, folks. But sometimes he wants us to get in there and start digging a ditch. There was another guy, Old New Testament. He'd been blind since the day he was born. What does Jesus do? Walks up. Scoops up a handful of dirt, right? (laughs) Spits in it. Mashes it around. Sticks it in his eye, right? Thanks, I think. Kind of gross. But Jesus says to him, go and wash your eyes in the pool of Shalom. In other words, I'm going to do my part, but I want to make sure you go and do your part. You show me your faith, I'll show you my faithfulness. Because you see, folks, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I believe there's just too many people waiting for God to show them his faithfulness. But they're not willing to show God any of their faith. You need to take a step of faith. You want to heal a relationship that's gone bad, that's broken? Maybe you need to preemptively forgive, even if you weren't the one who did wrong. Maybe you need to step out in faith if you want to see healing there. Maybe you need to treat somebody with love when all they've done is be ugly to you. You know what that is? That's digging a ditch. I know a lot of people will say, Oh yeah, Pastor, I want, I, I want my kids to grow up in Jesus and to be strong Christians, and yet they're not active in a church. They don't bring their kids to Sunday school. They never send their kids to a youth group. They never sit down and pray with their kids. They never read the Bible with their kids. Right? You want some water? You got to dig a ditch. Be a godly parent. Be a godly grandparent. Do something, right? People say, oh, man, I, I want more of God's blessing. I want more money or I want more of whatever. And God gives us this ridiculous principle that by our human minds doesn't make sense. It seems absurd. seems ridiculous. But God says, if you are generous with your time, your treasure, and your talents, then he will bless us in return. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Man, you read the Bible if you're an outsider and you go, this sounds kind of backwards. But the way of God is not the way of this world, folks. And sometimes, 
I think oftentimes God wants us to step out in faith. If we will step out in faith, faith, he will prove himself to be faithful. Sometimes you've got to dig a ditch. Only God can send the water. Let us not mistake that. But sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. Many times in our lives, God is waiting to unleash his blessing. But because we haven't moved, because we haven't stepped out in faith, because we are unwilling to take a risk in his name, we miss out on that blessing. Oh yeah, I'd love to have my neighbor go to church, be a Christian. But I don't want to be uncomfortable talking to him. Right? Oh yeah. I wish I had a good relationship with my sister. She's a jerk. She says bad things about me. She treats me mean. She took this. She stole that. She lied about this. I want to have a good relationship with her, but I don't want to forgive. Nah, that sounds, nah, that's not for me. Folks, we need to step out in faith. We need to lead the way as followers of Christ. And as we step out in faith, as we begin to move, God will move with us. Sometimes you've got to dig a ditch. So where is God speaking to you today about? Where do you need to get moving and get growing so that you can create some space for God's blessing in your life? God wants to bless you. I know that to be absolutely true. God wants to bless you. He has great things in store for you. But you need to take those steps of faith. You need to put your faith in action and see how amazingly God will show up. So your homework this week, take a leap of faith. Take a step of faith. Step out. Do something a little bit uncomfortable. Make a move towards and for God and see if he doesn't show up. Step out in faith. Dig a ditch. Amen. Let's pray.